Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. So I mentioned earlier, and I said I'll say it again, there's just um, that mindset in the body of Christ where, you know, people still have that, oh, I'm not called. I'm not called into ministry. I'm not called into ministry. I'm not called, you know. And I hope that what we've, you know, touched in the last two episodes and what we'll touch again today will help against that, help to edify, you know, you know, admonish people. And please, you share, share, share what you're learning, you know, within your own sphere. Share. They don't all have to watch this video, okay? But then share the revelation of it. Share the understanding of it. Let them, and if they can, yeah, I mean... <laughs> They should come watch the video. You know, but share the revelation of it, please. Share the understanding of it. Share the insight of it. What, what are you getting? What are you gleaning? And all that. So no particular screen share to this. It's just, well, no screen share at all. So just us, and I think that that also works out fine. Um, thank you, Jesus. So I believe already. We're going to kick off from 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Okay, and then we're reading from the seventh verse. I just want to talk about certain things and build in to today's topic. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we, we find Paul talking about gifts, ministries, administration. So the 12th chapter, I mean, is, is one of the most popular, particularly when you want to talk about, of course, gifts of spirit, you know, and then the body and all. So, but for this first part, I just want to pick the seventh verse. You'll pick where the gifts have been talked about, and then we'll come back here again as often as we need to for today. All right. So first in chapter 12, and then from verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the spirit is given to everyone to profit with all. Okay. So the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to everybody. So everybody ought to have a manifestation of the spirit. Did you, did you get that? I'm sure we've looked through that before. So once again, what are we dealing with? The believer's ministry. Please remember that. We're dealing with the believer's ministry. So who has the manifestation of the Spirit being given to everyone? Who ought to have manifestation of the Spirit? Everyone. Do you see that? All right. So once again, we're trying to disabuse this. Um, I'm not called to ministry. I'm not called. Yeah, you might not be called to what we popularly refer to as a fivefold. But every member of the body of Christ has a ministry. And part of this is the fact that every member of the body ought to have the manifestation of the Spirit. Because the Spirit lives in you. And He's not living in you just to hibernate in you. He's living in you to find expression through you. We've dealt with that a whole lot last month. All right, how that Holy Spirit is in you for you. And then the Holy Spirit is in you for others. So we've touched it. Go over it again, please. You could just, you know, find it. Just, I mean, head back to the YouTube page and you see it. Okay. So the manifestation of the Spirit. So who ought to manifest the Spirit? Every believer. What does every believer, you know, <laughs> have? The Holy Spirit. And because of who you have, the Holy Spirit. And then you ought to manifest. All right. There ought to be that outflow. He is within, flowing out. So verse 7 again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Verse 8, for to one, please notice, one is given to one, is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. So one spirit is given to this person, that person, this other one, that other person. And then verse 11 says, but all these work it by that one and the self same spirit, dividing again, you'll see the word or phrase, every man severally as he will so he gives to every man so we note again there every man so we just like i said in that be to disabuse that thinking i'm not called to ministry no problem 
but you ought to have and experience the manifestation of spirit. The other extreme there is when people start having certain manifestation of the spirit, we start naming names, dubbing them titles, all right? So someone has certain operations, you know, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, we call the person prophet, you know, we just call people pastor. We, we just easily dub titles, all right? And then all because, no, every believer ought to have, so I, I believe, okay, and I think that might be obvious, because the operations of the Spirit is not prevalent amongst believers, so it's easy to give a title to someone that we have around us who seems to flow in these things more. The person could flow in it, not because the person has an office, well, this person is given more to it, or as you know, spend time in prayer, desiring, or sometimes, which I was just saying before, it just happened. I've seen cases where someone is operating gifts of the spirit, and you ask, Oh, so did you pray? Did you fast? Did you desire? Nope. I just realized from when I got a few the Holy Ghost, I started knowing things. It's just that, you know, it's just that. So, so we need to see that here we're being told by God's word that there are gifts. Please understand. We're told that there are gifts, okay, manifestations of the Spirit. Now we'll jump now to the 28th verse of the same chapter, all right? So it says there, and, and, I, and I want you to just understand. It says, uh, but if there, now, nah, yeah, I'm still, am I there? No. Oh, I knew, I knew something was fishing. I had unconsciously changed or flipped one, one page extra. All right. So the 28th verse. Here we go. Yep. First thing else, 12, 28. It says to us, and God has set some in the church. Okay. God has set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondly, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After the miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, all right? And it, it, it enters that part that people get to have an issue with. Our all apostles, our prophets, our teachers, our workers of miracles, have all gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, all right? So people have said, oh, it might be that God is saying that he didn't give it to all, but that, that's, he's talking about ministries. All don't have the ministries here, and the tongues under this portion is not tongues as gifts, as you find between um, verses 7 and 11. No, the tongues here is a ministry. He's talking about ministries here, all right? Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles. So miracle here is a ministry, you know? Uh, some Bible scholars believe that the evangelist saved for healing, all right, helps, okay? Ministry, government, some believe that that means pastor, all right? Diversity of tongues. So it won't have done ministry, 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 then just switch to gifts. He had dealt with gifts between 7 and 11. Here he's dealing with ministries, offices, right? Ministries and offices. So we see here, apostles god has set who set in the church god verse 28 again and god has set some in the church not all so there are offices and they were given to some people okay but every believer ought to flow in the gifts of the spirit but then certain things were set by god to be given to some all right and first some you know transition say firstly so almost like you know top on the list there is apostle and we find out that when ministries are usually talked about apostle comes first usually you know in the arrangement prophet comes again all right and also we could just jump quickly to ephesians and then the fourth chapter of the book of ephesians and verse 11 we'll still be back again here we'll just allow me move around just build this thing and we're gonna get it soon so in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, both instances on the list, apostle comes first, prophet comes first, then the rest of the list is arranged, all right? But we see here offices again, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. If you notice the language in Ephesians 4, 11, 
all right? It says to us clearly, and he gave some, all right? If you notice the language also in 1 Corinthians 12 and the 28th verse, it says, and God has set some in the body. So the offices are for some, but there's the general ministry of the believer. The offices are for some. There's the general ministry of the believer. Now, how is this leading to where we're headed today? With these offices, if we do not understand the purpose of these offices, we would abuse them. The people in the offices themselves would abuse the privileges. These are not boss modes, if you understand what I'm saying, all right? So be here or in any of these offices for the sum doesn't make you a boss babe, you know, a boss man, all right, you know, where you have the opportunity to order people around. And no, Jesus, you know, was saying to his disciples, he said, the lords or the rulers over the Gentiles get to lord it over them, but that it should not be so in the kingdom. All right. So there are ways we talk to people, ways we react to people, ways we, you know, respond and all of that. You know, well, I, I, I'm their pastor, you know, and all of that. It's just basically an abuse. And we'll see these things. Okay, while, while what we're sharing today might in certain ways, uh, maybe some, anyway, let's just keep going. So we see, we see the rules here. We've dealt with this and we'll keep dealing with this. We have what is for some. We've got what is for all. I said, I think it was about two episodes ago, you know, people love to do, oh, I celebrate grace. I celebrate grace. Question is, who is not graced? Now, watch this now. There are recognizable graces, okay? In Galatians chapter 2, Paul went to visit, right, the elders, so to say, in Jerusalem. I mean, they were elders, you know. I'm just used to say, so don't get that wrong. In Jerusalem, and he said they have recognized, they perceived the grace of God that was on him for the Gentiles. They saw it, they perceived it. So grace is perceivable. These, these kinds of graces come par assignment. All right. And these kinds of graces are also evident part what each person does with the grace or anointing of God upon his or her life. So two things we need to note. While we celebrate the grace of God on someone, an outward show, great manifestation of that grace, person has taken our time to develop himself or herself, you know, built, you know, all of that. Well, like, wow, that, that person is great. So she's grace. He's grace. We mustn't do that at the detriment of unduly lowering ourselves as though, ah, God, when would you pity me? When would you just look on me and give me some grace? I know we've spent some time on this, but some of these things just bear repetition because the world out there is a bit loud, okay? Quite loud, quite loud. The seventh verse of that Ephesians chapter number four says, but unto every one of us, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So who has grace? Everybody. Now the grace for all is for all. Some are now graced for certain functions, but all have graces. Please understand that. So everyone here now watching this video or live right now, watching later, listening to audio, you are graced. You need to find what it is, cultivate it, and you will see the beauty that will come out of it. We, we, I, I remember there's this very mini book by Kenneth e. again, you know, laying on her hands, and he talked about towards the end, you know, the couple he had heard of, where, and I must have shared this in one of the editions before, but I mean, it fits right here. He heard about how that they had a, you know, typically, you know, he didn't anoint him, but it wasn't. You know, but he didn't even call it that. They had great results in praying for the sick, as in like miraculous results. In one particular case, there's this woman that each time you know a doctor couldn't handle a case, he referred the patient to the woman. And that was because when that doctor was a kid and he was also giving up on his mom, took him to that woman, he got prayed for, he got healed. So when he became a doctor, he just knew what I not what I cannot handle. I will send it over to her. Now, 
Again, finds his one and begins to ask, oh, do you have a call, you know, special call? Nope. Do you have a special anointing? Nope. How did he get into this? Well, we saw in God's word, in Mark 16, that you lay hands on the sick and they recover, and we acted it out. So basically that. So someone picks up something by faith, according to God's word, and begins to practice it. What happens when you use something? It develops. You become more proficient in it. It develops. So while someone is anointed for it, you who seem to have just had one talent measure on that could keep growing your measure because it says that unto each one of us is grace given, Ephesians 4, 7, according to the measure of Christ. So maybe what you had is a one talent type measure, two talent type measure. Don't devalue it. Or because of some, you know, or because of me or anybody, don't don't devalue it. Honor all men, because some people understand this revelation also, but to another extreme. All right, so it leads them into dishonor, disrespect, devalue, and that is not you know Christ-like. So it, it's off. Honor men. In fact, put them in all their places. Give them the due, the respect, and everything. But walk on the grace of God because the job cannot be done by some. The job can never be accomplished by the some. It takes all. All right. So it's wonderful. So our job, okay, those of us in the some, and we'll see that again, we'll see that again, and before now, we'll see it again. The work of those of us in the some is to equip the all, so that everybody gets busy. Everybody got to get busy. Everybody has to get busy, okay? Now, so we're getting this. We have some, we have all. And it's not, um, you know, a bougie, you know, like upper class, lower class kind of structure. So we in the song, we're the upper class in the kingdom, all right? And then the rest are the, no, that's, that's not it. Please again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28 says, and God has set some in the church. There's something interesting here. Roles and responsibilities in the church are not the same as roles or, or placement, rather, in the body or in the kingdom of God. I'll, I'll, I'll say that again so it's clearer. Roles and responsibility in the church should not be mistaken, okay, for placement in the body of Christ. I'll use marriage and then I'll come back. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, Paul is talking, okay, about marriage. And then it is just interesting. I could just, uh, how many verses should we read? Uh, we just read straight from verse one. Uh, okay. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I have, you know, keep the ordinances as I have delivered them unto you. But I would have you to know that the head, and I want you to follow this, verse, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Did you see that? Okay. The head of every woman is the man. The head, all right, of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Headship. So people read here every, and if you've ever read Ken Hagen's material on, you know, the woman question, he explained that the word woman here could also be used for wife, you know, because, you know, some have taken that to the extreme and say, you know, men are heads over women, but that's not so. This is structure for the home. Please understand that, all right? This is structure for the home. So that's why, uh, should, we, should we, all right, we'll just read a little bit. <laughs> all right. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, or a dishonor of his head, and every woman that prays or prophesies, 
all right, with our head uncovered, uh, uh, his head covered, he, our head uncovered, this one as our head, for <laughs> that is even, I mean, it is even worse stuff. Maybe I pause there. So if the woman praying with her head uncovered dishonors her head, she must have had to have a head. That, that's where I'm going with what I was trying to read. She must have. So every woman. So what about the one that is not married? So does she need to go and look for a head in the market or something? So so the context here is marriage. That's what I'm trying to bring out. It's, it's marriage. So it's not um, every woman, you know, so all men are heads over all women. So you now have to go and be looking for, oh, are you my head to, today or tomorrow? No, it's structure for the home. Please get this. This is structure for the home. The layering, all right? The head of Christ is God. Then Christ is the head of the man. Then the man is the head over the woman. Structure for the home. Why am I saying that? And I'm using that once again to teach because these things are like a, like Paul said in Ephesians chapter five was, you know, talking about husbands and wives. And I said, I'm really talking about Christ and the church. So we need to, you know, see that in the book of Galatians and then the third chapter, you know, of the book of Galatians, verse 28, Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ. So position in the home, structure for the home is not the same or should not be mistaken as status. Please understand that. Structure in the home, in the home, the man is the head of the home, all right? Structure, man is the head of the woman, structure in the home. But don't mistake it for status in Christ. So that means in Christ, the men are higher. No, that means in Christ, the men or the husbands are higher. No. In the kingdom, there's no male or female. I see that here. In the kingdom. But to structure a home, there needs to be order, right? First Peter, and then chapter number three of First Peter. We just jump straight to the seven. First Peter 3, 7. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The point I'm picking up there, heirs together. Because if we are privileged to be called joint heirs with Jesus, why would we assume that we have a higher inheritance in Christ more than our wives, and seriously even for parents more than our children or grandchildren? Why do you, would you think so? We're all one, all of us in Christ, we're one. However, for structure, for governance, so pastors, leaders, whatever responsibilities or roles you have, don't assume, please, don't make that mistake to assume that because you're part of the sum, then it is equal to your status in the body. So we look down on people. We talk down at people. We, you know, we, we do all of that. But in Christ Jesus, these are brothers and sisters. We are all equal in Christ. Roles and responsibilities should not be mistaken. Should not be mistaken. How did we get there? 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has set some in the church. King James says first. Some say firstly, all right? Firstly. And so the apostle's office seems to be number one office. And so it's easy, even for people who've not begun ministry now, to want to dub the title apostle. If that's your calling, fine. All right? If it is, if it's, but even, even if it is, sometimes it's not necessary to put it in out there. Let the work speak for itself, which, which is a beautiful thing about it. Let the work speak for himself. All right. I mean, Kenneth, he again, hardly referred to himself as an apostle. All right. People did. People referred to him as an apostle, 
He talked more about his office as a prophet and a teacher. He spent more time talking about those. So he wasn't, but <laughs> even anyone who just stumbled into ministry like a year ago, or just got born again when, well, depending on the circle you you know you got born again in, you would hear about Kenny Hagen. He's fed generations with the word. He heralded a message for a generation and generations. That's an apostle. I do not think Wigglesworth referred to himself as an apostle, but was he was known as such. All right? Some want to pull up that, oh, but I'm a prophet, I'm this. It, it's fine if, if, you know, when necessary. I've seen Kenny Hagin do that. I've seen, you know, um, well, I've read William Bram. I think I've seen a few clips. It goes in those clips. All right, William Bram also do that. Do you believe I'm a prophet of God? And the reason why was because Jesus, the head of the church, asked them to do so. Outside of that, this man won't. All right? So, but once again, and I'm saying this clearly, do not mistake, all right, our position or responsibilities in that some department as our status, our standing. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Pastor XYZ. You know, I'm, you know, head of whatever it is in my church. I'm this, I'm that. You know, all these members, they're really unserious. I don't know about their salvation, you know. Whatever I think you want to say. No, these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have to relate with them as such. We have to see them as such and then relate with them as such. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is getting clear. So the same way, and I'm about to enter, you know, what will just very likely take us on for the next maybe an hour or so. The same way, the structure in the church, or in the home rather, is Christ, then the man, then the wife. That same way, the church has structure. Apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, you know, all that. So we have structures. Please get that. However, however, hear me now. While the highest office, right, in the church might be the apostle, the highest office in the kingdom is not. I believe you're with me. So while the highest office in the church might be that of the apostle, the highest office in the kingdom is not and when i say what it is you'll be like oh really oh all right, all right, all right. <laughs> the highest office in the kingdom of god is the office of the son please get that it, it's that simple all right sonship is the highest office the office of the son that's that, that's that's a big deal in the body or in, in, in the kingdom. For structure's sake, for administration's sake, all right, for ministry's sake, God puts structures. But in the kingdom, now, Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter number 4, we'll just speak it from the seventh verse. Bible tells us that unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. To every one of us, grace is given according, according, grace is given to every one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ, right? Verse 8, wherefore, please follow me, he says, when he, he who will be he, he ascended up on high, Jesus the Son. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he, Jesus, gave gifts to men. Right? When he ascended, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it also? But that he, you know, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, all right? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens that he might feel all in all. The one who descended is the one who ascended. Verse 
um, he left he that ascended, right? And gave gifts according to verse 8, 11. And then he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. I want you to picture something. When Elijah was about to be caught up, and Elisha kept following him, right? And finally, Elijah asked Elisha, what do you want? Elisha says, double portion of your anointing. Elijah says, you have asked a very difficult thing. However, if you see me when I'm caught away, you got it. Then a chariot, you know, fire flows through, parts them one side and the other. Elisha, seeing that, shouts, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Then the mantle of Elijah fell. I want you to picture. Use this verse here and picture. Jesus ascended up on high, gave gifts to men. Ascended, gave. Ascended, gave. So Elijah was ascending, then he gave. Please follow this. Elijah was ascending, then he gave. Now, the mantle was just a cloth, okay? However, it represented the calling. It represented, it was just, you know, a cloth, like a jacket, you know, like an overall. That's what it was, but it just represented that. But follow again the sequence, how it happened, when it happened. Elijah is ascending, then he gives, all right? This, no man can receive what the father didn't give to him. And I've had to, you know, come to the fact that we've taught this Elijah, Elisha thing, and it's applicable, all right? Whatever anointing you want, you could go for it, get it and all. It's, it's true, it's applicable. However, in Elisha and Elijah's case, it wasn't Elisha's original desire to catch the mantle of Elijah. It was God who told Elijah, go and anoint Elisha, the son of Saphat, to take over from you. All right, so there was a call. There was, you know, God initiated it. God, God you know, so I'm, I'm just trying to add that in. Now, having, you know, said that, if Elisha didn't do anything about it, he might not have received it. Maybe so, right? Maybe so. But we just need to, be mindful of this, this very fact, all right? So now, Elijah ascends, Elijah rather ascends, and then gives. He ascends, he gives. He ascends, he gives. Jesus ascended up on high. Let, so question is, who ascended? An apostle? No. A prophet? No. Please understand why I'm saying no. He was all of that, but who was ascending? It was the son. Okay, but just as Elijah was going and then transferred from what he has or gives, well, divinely, God did that, that transaction was divine. What Elijah has moves on to Elisha. So what Jesus walked in, stood in, carried, was now distributed to the son. You see verse 8. He ascended up on high. He led captivity captive. And he gave gifts to men. All right? So what were the gifts? Apostle. If you look at Hebrews, and then the third chapter, the first verse. Hebrews chapter number one. Well, no, that's not, I mean, the only reference, if you want to find references, the fact that Jesus said it was sent. The word apostle means one that is sent, right? But I'm just, you know, trying to show you where the word at least apostle you know, shows up. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So when it comes to the office of the apostle, he stood in it, he had it. All right? Well, he's still an, uh, the apostle of our confession. When it comes to which one now? Prophet in Luke chapter number four. If you remember from the 18th verse, yes, you know, was reading, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me, you know, heal the broken heart, I said that blessed them that are bruised. You know, he, he, he said all that. And then he ended up, you know, saying today this, you know, prophecy is, is fulfilled in your hearing. But I just want you to notice what he said in the 24th verse. And he said, all right, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. So he refers to himself here as a prophet. I see him that. So we've seen him referred to as an apostle. We see him referring to himself here as a prophet. 
evangelist, the same Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is evangelistic. All right, Jesus went about teaching, but also preaching. So he had evangelistic, you know, movements. <laughs> Did you see that now? And for which one now? Pastor in John chapter 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. All right, John 10, 27, I am the good shepherd. So he is a pastor. The word shepherd there is also the word pastor. And for teacher, Matthew chapter 9, that should be the 25th, th no, 35th verse, that Jesus went about the villages, right, teaching and preaching. In fact, Jesus went about teaching, preaching, healing, and he seemed to have done teaching a lot more, you know, than anything else. So all I'm doing now is just showing you the fact here, all right, that Jesus ascended, Elijah sends, hands over, Jesus is ascending, hands over. What did he hand over? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, because he had it. So he gives it to all, no, to some. But question is, who ascended the Son? Who stood in these offices? The Son. But now in the body, Offices have defined us, not sonship, okay? Offices have influenced our self-esteem rather than sonship. So I'm not satisfied with being a son. I want an office, all right? I want to be known. I want to have a title. I'm not satisfied with being a son. But that's because you do not, of the body of Christ, we do not have a revelation of sonship. So that even when you are in one office or the other, who is in those offices? A son. Are we getting this? The highest office in the kingdom of God is the office of the son. Okay? The son. The son. That's the highest office. Now, back again to Ephesians chapter number four. It's, it's getting interesting. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Father. So in Ephesians 4, we stopped at the 11th verse. So we read 18 to 11. He, wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Please look at it from verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. So this psalm had to relate with the all, the rest. For the perfecting of the rest, the saints. For the work of ministry. So that the saints to do the work of ministry. Read that, we've seen that in other episodes. All right. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So the psalm, right, would equip. The word perfect, that means to equip. The psalm, equip the rest so that the rest will do ministry and then the body of Christ will be edified. So the edification of the entire body, once again, we've said this before, it needs to be said, is not the job of the sum. All right? No matter how large a, a, a church or ministry is and how great a man or woman of God is, there are people in our spheres, offices, streets, market, mall, mechanic, workshop, that these men and women of God will not be with. So it takes the rest as we spill into the society to carry the growing of his graces and the equipping we have received into all of his places to be a blessing. And then the body is edified. Okay. Let's assume you have a large conference in a city and about 100,000 people gather, 200,000 people watch online. That's a total of about 300,000 people. All right? Or 10,000 people gather, 50,000 people watch online, whatever the number, or 500 people gather, 1,000 people watch, whatever the number, right? There are many more people that never will show up there or that they will hear about it. Or You understand that? So, so many more. But the impact being held on those saints that had a period of gathering or were able to gather can now spread and become exponential because they go into their strata without demeaning themselves, 
but understanding I have grace and I'm being equipped to carry out some ministry. All right. Now, so for verse 12 again cuts out the roles and responsibilities. For the perfecting of the saints, that's equipping of the saints. For the work of ministry, the saints who do the work of ministry, for the edifying of God of Christ. Now, close our attention from verse 13, please. Please close our attention from here. Till we all come. Who? All. Who is all? Some plus the rest. Follow, please, verse 13. Till all of us come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son. So the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are learning about the Son and Sonship and ought to communicate what they learn and use it to equip because all of us need to come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son unto a perfect man. Watch this unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Please understand this. So every one of us, every one of us is growing into the fullness of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11 that we read earlier, Paul said, so be followers of me as I follow Christ. So at the end of the day, who is everybody following? Christ. All right, we just follow other people that we could see a lot more nearer, closely, physically, and all that, but the end point is Christ. So the totality of your passion, your desire, your willingness to grow. Listen, if you push for this verse to be fulfilled in your life, you will do ministry at a great level and impact a lot of lives. I didn't say you're going to have a signboard. I didn't say you're going to have a logo. I didn't say you're going to have websites. I didn't say you're going to have a lot of that. I'm saying you will, you will, you will evidently be a sign and a wonder. Why? Because you will be a, 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 you know, watch this now so you get what I'm saying. Spiritually speaking, we're just like him, all right? First John chapter 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we. I will find other verses that talk about our union and oneness with him. All right, but that is, so to say, in a dormant state. But imagine when you push and grow and all your growth is to come into this verse. You'll come into people and there'll be something strange, something different. You'll be impacting lives here and there. You without a logo, without signboard. So we've limited ourselves to these things. Okay? And it needs a shift. It needs a switch. It needs all of that to happen to us. Me inclusive. So I'll read again 13, okay, and then I pick it, you know, just, <laughs> just follow me on this. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of first I'm going to read it and I'll be back. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie away to deceive or still going but speaking the truth in love watch what i'm about to read now I'm, I'm sure you're reading also but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ so the aim second time again in this place the aim we saw it in verse 13 now we see here in Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So what's my aim? Growth into Christ. What's my purpose? Growth into Christ. What's my calling? Growth into Christ. As I fellowship with him, as I interact with him, as I spend time with him, knowing him, learning and, and being tutored, being equipped by those he places me under, as all of that's happening to me, what am I becoming like him? I am in my spirit. Yeah. But that's not where it should be limited. Okay, it needs to take over me. It has to take over me. Are we seeing this, please? The highest office in the body, in the entire body, all right, in the kingdom, is the son. 
the highest office. People have passed off from this earth who are apostles and missionaries and all of that. And they've left, they've, you know, they moved on, they, you know, transited into heaven. So I didn't have like, oh, I'm apostle G and I'm sister C and I'm, I'm you know, pastor F. And it, it's a gathering of sons. <laughs> It's a gathering of sons. Should we then, you know, which some have said, oh, then the offices are rubbish. No, the Bible won't put in rubbish. We need to know what part you belong to, where you serve, what function are you? Are you the hand, the wrist? Are you the elbow? Are you the toenail? We need to know that. It helps us know. It helps you to know so you know what your supply is. We can't rubbish it. But everyone is a member of the body. And the highest office in the body really is the head of the body. Are, are we seeing this, please? The highest office in the body, in the kingdom, all right, is the head, is the son. The highest office in the church system. First Corinthians 12 and 28, God has set in the church, firstly, not in the body. The body has a head. So you might be head of your home or head of a ministry or head of a department, head of a unit. The rest of the people there are not subject to you. They're brothers and sisters. They need to honor you for your work's sake. And Paul wrote that. They need to honor you. In fact, the Bible says they need to give you double honor to their things that need to be done. All right, so you're honored, you're respected. They need to make your work easy, according to Hebrews chapter 13. They need to do all that because you're going to give a town. So Bible teaches what roles are. So these are roles and responsibilities, not status. Don't mix them up. Don't let your self-esteem be, oh, one day when I become a pastor. Woo! Oh, one day when I'm an evangelist also. Woo! One day, you know, one day. Fall in love with who you are. Value yourself as a son. Because the highest office is that of the son. And the highest privilege is to be called a son. Please understand that. First John chapter number three. All right. First John chapter 3 from the first verse. So John, John says here, I mean, I could quote it, but I'm just going to read, okay? First John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the sons of God. And we've read this verse so many times, if we're not careful, we just gloss over it. No. John said, wow. That, that was what the man was saying. Like, wow. See, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed, lavished. All right? He poured out great love that we may be called apostles. No. That we may be called pastors and teachers to the body of Christ. I mean, I have that privilege. Paul said God found us faithful, putting us into the ministry. So is God, you know, showing you, you know, his faith in you. Okay, do this for me. Do that for me. Do this for me. Do that for me. But you were first of all brought on that greatest platform of being a son. Are you understanding this? John again says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Behold! All right? You want to take this in for a few seconds? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a son. Like, wow. Like, wow. I'm a son. 
and saying, therefore the world doesn't know us because the world doesn't know him. Verse 2 says, beloved, now, hallelujah, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we we'll see him as he is. Now are we the sons. Now are we the sons. We could touch that ladder, Papa, we've done that in other teachings. So let's just stay focused here. Why, why, why is John excited? Now, some of you have heard me teach this, but I don't want your mind running after, you know, doing the palpitations of the verses. The most important thing is, are we walking in this reality? Why was John wowed as to us being called sons? Why? Because <laughs> John knew the son. Okay. John chapter number one, and it's, it's just so beautiful. In John one, and then the 14th verse, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Please understand this. John says the word was made flesh, and that word, dwelt amongst us the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us he now says we saw his glory john said we saw something what did we see we saw his glory he now goes on to say the glory as of the only begotten meaning only one kind of person has this kind of glory it's the son of god did you get that the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He is the only begotten. And he, I mean, the kind of glory he displayed, only the Son of God can display. And he is the only Son of God. He's the only begotten. So John said, I saw his glory. And what was the glory? Diverse signs, wonders, and miracles. In chapter 2 of St. John, I mean, after the miracle that came out of Galilee. John, you know, says it in, in, in a very interesting way. In verse 11 of chapter 2, John said, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And the disciples believed in him. So the miracle here was part of a display of glory. This beginning of miracles did Jesus John said, he said, and manifested forth his glory. John, John was wild. John, John was like, <laughs> oh dear. I'll read from John chapter 21. Okay, and then verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone... I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. <laughs> so he did one miracle in Cana. John said he manifested his glory. Now, John at the end of this gospel said, if, if everything had to be written in books, the world, not Jerusalem, all right, the world will not contain the books. So you can imagine the, the back to back display of glory. All right. We, should we count the very obvious ones of walking on water? That's when they said, What manner of man is this? Raising the dead. Back to back miracles. Back to back. That's what Johnny's saying. If we try to write all these things, we won't have space. So John saw him. This is the only begotten of the Father. In Matthew chapter number 16, from the 13th verse, of course, Jesus is with them in Caesarea Philippi. And, you know, I guess they're having fun. <laughs> so he asks them, you know, who the men say that I am? And they begin to say this, this, that, 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 that. Verse 15, and he said unto them, but who do you, you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son 
of the living God. So you are the anointed one and you are the son. And you, of course, you know the answer. I just said, blessed are you, Simon Bajo, not flesh and blood, did not reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. What did Peter say? You are the Christ, you are the son. You are the Christ, you are the son. The highest office there is, is sonship. The highest office is the office of the son. Are, are, we, are we getting this? I believe we are, right? In Matthew chapter 17. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And after six days, Matthew 17 from verse 1. And after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain. Hallelujah. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, talking with him. That's Elijah, right? Talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Lord, it, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles. Okay, one for you, one for Moses, and then, you know, one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. So you've had prophets, you've had the Lord, hear him. Who, son? The highest office. The highest office. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times and diverse manners and Time past, speak unto our fathers by the prophets. As in these last days spoken to us by his son. Whom, that is the son, he has appointed to be heir of all things. And by whom also he made the world. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of the person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down. And right under the majesty on high. So verse one again, God, who at Sunday times in diverse manners and you know, time past spoke to our fathers by the son. I mean by the prophets. Verse two, as in these last days spoken to us by his son. So we just saw in Matthew chapter 17, God has spoken through Moses, God has spoken through Elijah, representing the prophets, Moses the law. God is saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, him, him. The highest office. Is the son and the son stood in a class all by himself. All right, he he is the son. So you could try to understand without us getting too far into sonship today. Understand, you know, John's bewilderment. John knew the son. John saw the son. John hung out with the son. John was mesmerized with the back-to-back -back miracles the son did. John would be glad to just be a servant to the son. All right, now I know we know I'm not a servant. You know, yeah, but do we have the value of sonship that we should? If you, I mean, Elijah, you know, I mean, rather, Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, all right, talk about when he saw the Lord and the train of God filled the temple. And he began to say, oh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and all of that. Now, yeah, we could say, you know, he did understand righteousness and just talk over it. I haven't yet seen the appearance of Jesus Christ. But I remember when Ken Hagen said he saw him. And Hagen had that, you know, he said, you just see, you just see yourself. Like, man, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. Because you see that beauty of his purity. Now, we know, spiritually speaking, we look like that. Jesus helped him say, no, stand up. Thou art worthy, thou art, you know. So Jesus had to do that to him. Now, some leave that place. Maybe they didn't hear Jesus say that back to them. So some will leave that. Was just, I'm a worthy. And Jesus says, okay, you know, maybe something like that. But thank God, all right? And it's forgetting his story, which I will stay with. 
You know, I mean, just corrected him and said, you're worthy. You're, you're worthy. I made you worthy. Stand up. But that, wow, that, which happened, in, you know, in Revelation chapter 1 to John. John sees him and then John just falls out like, so they knew the son. They rode with the son. To now be called a son like him? Huh? Like me to him? Oh, thank you, Father. <laughs> thank you, Father. We thank you. Thank you, Father. Learning something? You want to type? You want to maybe give me a thumbs up? Learning something. Let me let me know. Let me hear. You know, you want to type it? Just uh, maybe just do it. Thumbs up. All right. You know, but I mean, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. The highest office is the office of the Son. And what a privilege to be called a Son. What a privilege. All right, what a privilege to be called. When Jesus was teaching them prayer, he said, say, you know, in this format, our Father. Because Jesus came to introduce sonship. Now sons will serve. That's where offices will come in. That's where structure and systems and all of that will come in. Sons have to serve. Right? Sons will serve. But you have to understand that your self-esteem is not limited to an office that you have or do not have. You know, and you're not waiting one day when God finally is happy with me and he brings me into this meaning. If you understand sonship and you understand who you are as a son, you will minister to people. People will come in contact with you and the operations of the spirit will be there. You don't need a title. You, you don't. You, you don't need any of these things to be impactful, to be relevant, to be resourceful, to Allow the life of God to flow through you. All right, in John chapter number, you know, four, I mean, John five, rather, 26, it says, as the father has life in himself, he gave to the son to have life. And what did the son do? He came that you and I may have life. So it's, it's, it's sonship. Behold the manner of love the father has lavished on us that we, you and I, should be called sons. Galatians chapter number four. I mean, we know it. Uh, let's, let's read it. Galatians in chapter four. And it's it's this this revelation is just so beautiful. And I'm I'm glad. Thanks for the comments and the thumbs up, guys. Thanks. Woo, glory to God. <laughs> Galatians 4 and 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You are a son. Did you see that? Because you are sons, God put the spirit of the son, the highest office. You've been brought into sonship. Huh? Verse 7, wherefore you are no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then heir of God through Christ. And we've talked this before, maybe we'll do it again later. Sons are heirs. All right, sons are the ones that walk in inheritance, not friends, not servants, sons. You need to value your place as a son and walk in fellowship and understand who you are and be thankful. Wow, I'm a son. I'm a son. Glory to God. Chapter 3, now that was chapter 4, 6, and 7. Chapter 3 of the same Galatians. Oh, thank you there, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And then the 26th verse says, And you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Who? You. <laughs> You are all children of God by faith in Christ. All of us are children of God. 
All of us actually have our faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter number eight. I mean, we know about the verses, don't we? But connect them, see them. Right? Connect it, see it. Be blessed. Let's walk in the reality of it. Thank you, Father. Romans 8 and 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received, not the language, received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You say, well, it's adoption. It's sonship. That's what he's teaching there. All right, you've been brought into sonship. And who is the world waiting for? The manifestation of sons. Yeah, of course, we're now going to the breakdown, the peels, heels, and all of that, all right? The babies, you know, and the children, the telios, and, you know, we, we could do that, but you need to understand that you are a son and your aim or your mission or your assignment or your calling or your purpose as a son is to grow into the full image of the son. Back again to Ephesians. And then chapter 4, the 13th and, you know, the 16th verses, 15th verses. So Ephesians 4, 13. Thank you, Bob. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You and I are supposed to come to the knowledge of the Son. We need to know the Son. Did you see that? And then we need to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Hmm. We read again. We need to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness. <laughs> That's the aim. This is the mission, the fullness of Christ. This is my aim. What is Christ filled with? Who is Christ? Was a fullness of Christ. Was a fullness of Christ. I have to pursue it. I have to go for it. Now this video, it's on YouTube. Some of you might have come across it. The fullness of God in Christ. It's been our Bible study for the last three weeks. Please. <laughs> um, just, you know, I could say, let me jump in and just go into it. But please, please. Watch the three videos. We might put the links again into the letter you will get, but watch the fullness of God in Christ. Wow. It's it's beautiful. Because if we say Christ is in me, what then is in Christ? And Ephesians, I mean Colossians 1 19 first that says, For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. So the fullness of God is in Christ. So watch this verse again. The last part, all right? Onto the measure, full measure, all right? You and I need to come to the measure of the stature of the full. I don't know how long it will take us, but let's be on the journey. My aim is to grow into the measure, into the stature, into the fullness of Christ. Your aim is to grow into the measure, into the stature, into the fullness of Christ. Our aim is to keep growing into the measure into the stature of a fool that's Christ, all that Christ is, all that Christ has, all that Christ can do, all that Christ is, all that Christ has, all that Christ can do, his fullness, that I walk in the fullness. Please understand. This is not, oh, he blessed me. Oh, I enjoy blessing. No, this is, I am walking in the fullness to a point of replication. Are you getting this? You know, because you could say, oh, I'm Abba's girl. I'm Abba's boy. Abba takes care of me. Abba, Abba. So we, we seem to just have Abba, like, you know, just, which is fine. You know, sugar daddy, he takes care of me. I'm okay. No, Abba gave birth to you. It means Abba's DNA is inside you. It means, therefore, you ought to express yourself. All right? 
or express the nature he has in you to your world. Are you seeing this? A cat gives birth to a cat. The monkey gives birth to a monkey, you know, all of that. So Abba gave birth to you. So it's not just for posing and for DMs and for T-shirts. Abba's baby, oh, you know, Abba is always, you know, watching over me, he can't break my heart. And then we just leave it at those little issues. I mean, well, sometimes it's just big for people, but you just, hey, it's, he gave birth to you. Are you getting where this is? He said, well, he is my supplier. I know, I know. But let's look at the son, because it's the 13th verse again, it says, till we come to the unity of the faith, all right, to the knowledge of the son. So how did the son be? For son just sitting down and say, you know, daddy, you got to bail me out right now. I got people to feed. No, he, you know, hey, let's give them food. All right. And obviously he himself knew what I was going to do. They have to sit down. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, that's the son. I see him is with me now. So that's how the son behaves. <laughs> yeah, that's how the son. Wow. And then he's walking on water, you know, sleeping in the boat, peace is still. So that's how a son behaves. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> are, you, are you catching this? I have a lot to learn. I just see, oh, God is my daddy. You know, God's my daddy. God's my daddy. <laughs> he's good. But then we look at the son. And then we look at how the son functioned. And we're like, oh, that's how I'm supposed to function. That's what I'm supposed to do. Like the sun. Because I am the sun. All right? I'm not the sun. I am a sun. All right? And I take my learnings, all right, from the sun. So when we begin to see it this way, it changes, all right, us from just being receivers. You know, where our sonship is just about receiving and getting. When it starts becoming about being and doing and replicating. Do you understand this, please? Still in that verse. Still we all come in the unity of faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, all right, unto a perfect man, perfect that is mature. You're fully grown, fully mature. Till we come. So it's a journey. All right, unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the, of the rather, unto the measure of the stature, full measure of his stature, his standing, his, you know, the measure of it, the gauge of it. So I need to come into that measure of his stature, of the fullness, the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means you and I, they put us side by side and we're able to be replicas of the Lord. We're able to reflect him. The way the moon reflects the sun, we're able to reflect him. All right, using you know that example that way, we're able to reflect him. Till we come, till we come, till we come. So the work of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers is not to raise disciples for themselves. It's not to raise pastor wannabes and prophet wannabes and apostle wannabes. You know, people want to be like them. You know, it's not to, yeah, we should be inspired. But, and all that is fine. But the whole essence is not to re raise people like us. They will imitate us. Paul has given room for that. But the whole essence is the imitation is based on our own imitation of Christ. So in the whole essence of it, Christ is a core imitation. Christ is a core imitation. So the whole you know, job of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher is equipping them as we're being equipped till all of us grow into the fullness of Christ. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in everything, which is ahead, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him 
in everything. So at the end of the day, my growth, if I, in my growth plan should basically be Christ. How to grow into him in how many things? How to walk in, and I'm just saying I, like all of us, we really are in, right? Should be that the level of wisdom is displayed. I want to grow and walk into it. All right? To grow up into him in all things. His level of love, his, his level of everything. All right? His, his sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It's just grow up into him in all things. Grow up into him in all things. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head. My aim, your aim. That, that's it. Now Romans chapter 8. Thank you, Jesus. In Romans 8, of course, from, from 26, we don't know what to pray for. The Spirit helps our infirmities. You know, so we, we use, we're used to that. So I'll just speak from the 28th verse, Romans 8 and then 28. It says, <laughs> not Romans 8, I'm in Romans 3. Romans 8, from you, from all right. Okay, so Romans chapter 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And I want you to follow this. Case. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren, whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to the old job of salvation ahead of time. God had planned that I'm bringing people into conformity, a perfect blend and replication, all right, of the image of the son. Oh, I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm just like him, just like me. It's in your spirit, yeah. Fantastic or great, glorious, whatever word you're going to use. But God said, no, walk in it. If it's all about what we have in our spirits, then Paul will be bothering, you know, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3, you know, telling them I, I, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual, as unto carnal, even as unto beige, you know, or Ephesians 4, that I'll be reading. Paul had to say, you need to grow. Be no more children, touch to. So if it's, you know, it's just who you are in your spirit, is fine. No, it's, it's not fine. It, it can't remain there. Grow up into him. So God is saying here, the aim, the purpose of predestination is so that we become conformed to the image of his son. That he might be firstborn amongst many brethren. Yes, he is firstborn among many brethren. We are his brothers and sisters. So he's firstborn. But to what extent are we walking in this reality? To, to what extent are we walking in this light? To what, what extent are we seeing this the way we ought to a walking, you've got to understand that God made you a son. God made you a son. And I've said before, I'll say again, do not mix up, all right? Please do not mix up, you know, responsibilities and roles and offices in the church. Don't mix it up with your status in Christ. So it might be, you know, very committed as a worker, you know, leader or something, and you don't have time to read your Bible like you should. You don't have time to pray, you know, but you still want to boss around and lot of, you're, you're making a big mistake. All right? Because eventually, the level to which you can walk in your inheritance in Christ is not based on offices and titles. It's based on your sonship and the revelation of it. So we need to know who we are as sons. We need to walk in this reality as sons. I am a son. And sons are heirs. So that your self-esteem, my self-esteem, our self-esteem is very, very intact. Very, very, very intact in sonship. Oh, we could lift our hands and say, Father, thank you. Why? I'm a son. I don't feel well. I'm not prophet. I'm not pastor. I'm not an evangelist. You know, maybe God has more time for them. You know, God just, you know, is, is you know, they, they've got God on speed dial, you know, uh, and all of that. No. 
No. Oh, hallelujah. What a privilege to be called God's own son. What a privilege to be called God's own son. What a privilege to be called God's own son. Now I could do sons and daughters, the way maybe an NLT or something put it, but I'm using the word son like the way King James would put it. But I'm sure we all understand what the context is. All right, we are in the son. There's no male or female. Wow, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm, I'm almost done. We still have quite some time, but I'm almost, I'm almost done tonight. Wow, thank you, Jim. Well, today, night, you know, um, afternoon. I'm almost done. Thank you. Thank you. What a privilege. What a privilege. No wonder John said, what manner? See the manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. See the manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called Son. See the manner of love. God called me his own son. You have to think about the right and the mindsets of the right hand. They saw the son. They walked with the son. They said, this is the only son of God. Now they are finding out that God's plan so that we can become sons like him. Like, whoa, 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 me, son, like him. And verse 2 of that first John 3 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, rise up, son. Rise up. Rise up to your rights and privileges. Rise up to the knowledge of who you are. Rise up to the knowledge of the Son and rise up in your knowledge. Through knowing him, as Son, you rise up into knowing who you are and how you should function as a Son. Rise up. All right? Rise up. Let's, let's rise up away from canality and, you know, the world and interpreting things from the world's view. God has brought you and I to that highest place. Highest place of sonship. Highest place of sonship. Oh, this is so amazing. This is so, so amazing. This is so amazing. Woo! This is so amazing. <laughs> Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 1. Thank you, Father. Hebrews 1. You know, talking about son and angel, son and angels and all of that. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me read from where. So just comparing Son and Angel, right? So I, I could just read from. Uh, let, let's just read. We'll, we'll read from four to the end, All right? Be made so much better than the angels, as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels did he say at any time, you are my son? He didn't say that to any angel. Please understand. He didn't say that to any angel. For unto which angel, which of the angels did God say at any time, thou art my son, or you are my son, this day have I begotten thee? None. No angel. So the son is different from an angel. The son is ranked high. All right? Thou art my son, have I begotten. And again, I will be to him a father. He will be to me a son. See? See the language. Bible is saying God didn't say that to any angel. I'll be to him a father. I'll be to me a son. So sonship is a privilege. Sonship is a honor. So if I, I mean, are you saying I, I I believe you are? I believe you are. It's the highest of all offices. It's the highest place to be. All right. I'm using offices intentionally and deliberately. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Verse 5 again, but unto which of the angels did he say at any time, you are my son, this day I might be God to me. And again, I will be to him a father who will be to me a son. Verse 6 now. And again, when he brings into... <laughs> no, let me read that well. And again, when he brings in the firstborn into the world, he's talking about son, right? He said, and let all the angels of God worship him. All right? Verse 7. And of the angels, he said, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, verse 8. But unto the Son, he said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of your kingdom. Verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you with all the gladness above your fellows. Verse 10, and the Lord, you know, in the beginning had laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Verse 11, now, they shall perish, but thou shalt remain, and they all shall wax old as a garment. Verse 12, and as a vesture, still is quoting, right? And as a vessel shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and your years shall not fail. Now, verse 13, how do you notice? But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until your enemies become a foot soul. So angels don't have the privilege of sitting. Son, it was the son that sat. And if you connect that to Ephesians 2, 6, you were raised up together with him. Are made to sit together with him. So you are seated. Angels don't sit. We have a privilege, a great honor, our sons, our sons, our sons, you and I, our sons of God, sons of the Father, sons in the house. I'm a son. I have rights and privileges. My self-esteem is in my sonship. Not in positions or title or logo or banner or whatever else it is. I will function effectively. Awareness, which I've explained for you, you want to register in ministry. Yes, you should have an identity. You should have a name. You should have all those kinds of things. But none of that is where your self-esteem should be attached. None of it. None of it. When sons get busy being sons, wow. Wow. So my job, according to Ephesians, is to equip you. All right? And then you go out to do the work of ministry. Then the body will be edified. Share this with somebody, please. See your placement in the body. Share with someone. Let them understand how this works. And let's be a huge blessing to people. Oh, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So rise up. <laughs> rise up. Rise up, son. Rise up in your revelation of who the son is. And then rise up in your revelation, therefore, of who you are as a son. And let your self-esteem be in how much the father has loved you, that he lavished his love all over you, making you a son. What love, what love, what manner of love the Bible says. What kind of love is this that I'm going to be brought into sonship like Jesus? Romans 8, 17 says, we're heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus. Yes, and I preached it too. You know, if there was a seat somewhere and it was only one and it said it was for Jesus, I could go up there and sit and just not complain and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, yeah, we're trying to push the revelation, you know, being joint heirs with him, but it should really sincerely be approached with awe. Now, we could preach it because, I mean, but we must have that awe. It must be approached with, see the privilege we've got. What did we do to qualify? But he qualified us. Hallelujah. What did we do? We didn't shed any blood. We didn't die any death. We didn't do anything. And now we sit together with him. How did we get there? It was in the Father's predestination. It, it predestined it. All we have to do was believe. <laughs> and then we become. Wow. This should be handled with utmost reverence. All right? It should be handled with utmost reverence. Thank you, Father. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I just want to go ahead and thank him for the privilege of sonship. All right, just go ahead, thank him for the privilege of sonship. Okay, so the believer's ministry is understanding that I need to grow. All right, grow into the fullness of Christ. And the truth is, as you do that, operations of the Spirit will come out of you. Operations of the Spirit. Why? Because in the fullness of Christ, there are signs, wonders, and miracles. Yeah, in the fullness of Christ, we've got signs, wonders, and miracles. In the fullness of Christ. So as all my aim is just to be like him. To be filled with his fullness. Filled with his fullness. 
feel this fullness. Feel this fullness. I will heal the sick. And I don't have to. It's just, it will be an outflow. I'm filled with this fullness. I'm filled with this fullness. I'm filled with fullness. Things will happen around me. I'll start knowing things supernaturally. What we call the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, according to 1 Corinthians 12. I'll start, you know, I'll feel. Why? Because you're being filled with the fullness of Christ. So Christ can't be where you are in that office or home or whatever it is, and nobody's feeling his impact. So if, if all we do is grow into the fullness of Christ, there'll be an outflow. There'll be manifestation of the Spirit. There'll be demonstrations of the Spirit. There'll be great move of God going on out of your belly. Will flow rivers of living water out of your belly. It is a belly of pastors and preachers and teachers. Out of your belly, everybody. And he said, this speak he of the Holy Spirit. All right? But the Spirit has not yet been given because yours has not yet been glorified. But still about the ministry of the Spirit in us. Out of your belly. These signs will follow them that believe. Who? Everyone. So if we keep growing to that fullness, imagine the signs and wonders and miracles that will flow from each one of us. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Can we just thank you? <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our ministry is fellowship with you. Our ministry is walking and cultivating our union with you. Our ministry core assignment is to understand and maximize the ministry of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. Father, today we've learned that our assignment, our core purpose and pursuit should be the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Our, our purpose, our pursuit, our purpose, our pursuit should be the measure of the stature. That's our aim. That's our goal. Measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Measure of the stature of, that's what I'm aiming at. To walk in the fullness of Christ. To walk in everything that is available for me to walk in. That's my aim. That's my calling. That's, if, if you do that, every other thing will take place, will take shape. Oh God, use me, use me. There will not be a need because once you walk in his fullness, you will be used. You can't carry fullness in you and he's not flowing through you to bless people. So there's no need for use me. God, use me. I'm praying you use me. No, the more you walk in fullness, it will flow out of you, out of you, out of you. Even when Jesus went, more than once, like when John the Baptist was killed and he just found a quiet place or when he wanted to go rest with the disciples and then he would see the crowd and compassion well up within him and he just begins, begins to minister to them. So when you are full, it will flow. Right? When you're full, it will flow. So let's pursue the fullness. Let's pursue the fullness. Let's, that's our aim. All right? And people like me need to be watchful. I have service tomorrow. I'm preparing. I have a meeting at the end of the month. I'm preparing. I got some meetings coming up. I'm preparing, but my preparation must not be meeting-based. It should be growth-based. And what's the growth? Christ in me. Christ in me. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right? Some people, when they're not in leadership anymore, they feel uncomfortable. When they've not preached for a while, have not even preached. Not... No, your self-esteem should be in none of those things. Your value should be in none of those things. None. Not sang in a while. Oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, just different things. None, none of that should be where our value is. All right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Oh, what a privilege. What a privilege to be called the son. What a privilege. Thank you, Father. Woo! Thank you, Father. Giving thanks unto the Father, Colossians says, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And his only son is inherited. Some of our sonship there. All right? 
<sighs> he has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. I'm a partaker. You are a partaker. How did we get there? Sonship. Study sonship, all right? You know, maybe we might need to get there soon. But I'm still chewing on this thing. Still, by trust, you know, this has been a blessing. You know, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. It's 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 been a blessing. I trust it's been a blessing. Wow, thank you, Father. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to God.